Thank you, Ignacio. Um, I will disclose that my mentor was Ignacio in training 10 years ago. So everything I know about PFO is thanks to Ignacio and Igor, who's actually in the room, Palacios. So it's been a good 10 years of clinical practice and really learning um, how to put this therapy forward. And certainly the clinical trials that we've seen and the results of those um, have now set the stage to where we feel a lot more confident in doing, in, in doing what, we, what should be done for patients in, in the right clinical circumstance. So the cat is out of the cage, and it's now our opportunity to really identify patients that may benefit from this therapy. And until recently, really our hands were tied with the lack of robust clinical data. We also now have um, the expert consensus statement that was recently published in uh, just this past January. And I really recommend that you guys take time to read this, maybe on your way back if you're deciding to embark on developing a PFO program. Um, but it's the first real document that uh, puts in place some orders, some guidelines as to uh, the structure of a PFO program, what it takes to build a program, the institutional requirements, the operational uh, operator requirements, and we're going to touch up a little bit, uh, touch up on some of these uh, elements that are published in this consensus document. So are you ready to become a PFO implanter? And I think that's um, the first question you really need to ask yourself. Um, I see a huge interest in the community on a day-to-day -day basis of individuals that want to do PFOs. They want to go off and train for a weekend and then come back and do a few of these. And, and they, they feel great. They feel like, wow, I was able to do this. And then next thing you know, a year goes by and they haven't done another implant. And that's really what this is not about. It's about developing a program that's going to be sustainable and that is fair and uh, just makes just to your patients and your hospital. So this is really the first question you need to ask yourself. Do I just want to be one of these casual implanters or not? Because we definitely discourage that, and, and the consensus document clearly states that. So yes, you're a tiger, but you don't want to be a lonely tiger in this game. You really want to build a team uh, to tackle a very important clinical problem that requires not only your knowledge, but the knowledge of those uh, your partners in a multidisciplinary team approach. So. This is taken straight from this uh, expert consensus statement. A PFO closure program must be established in the context of a larger stroke program that includes all stakeholders such as cardiologists, stroke neurologists, hematologists, and imaging specialists. And in our hospital, we also include pulmonary. We include, uh, we have actually a scuba diving medicine practice and one of the doctors in our hospital. And from time to time, he also is part of the program. Um, so it really goes to show you that this is, in nature, an institutional-based program. It's not just you, it's the team. Some tips and requirements for success. A PFO program should be an institutional in nature, as I mentioned. It is expected that physicians will operate within the context of a multidisciplinary team to optimize patient selection and clinical benefit, and it should be patient-centered care. Um, so my first word of advice for those that have never done one or have done just a few is get to know the data. That's first and foremost. And no, you don't have to read 2,000 articles that have been published in this subject, but definitely come to know that there is a world of PFO literature that is quite important and that you need to become familiar with not only the randomized trials that we presented and alluded to earlier, but also come to realize that there is a, a diversity of comorbidities related to this fascinating defect that we all once thought or believe it was benign in nature. Um, and we all can relate to these complex clinical scenarios with patients with platypnea orthodeoxia. There's data on obstructive sleep apnea and a lot of interesting literature coming out on, uh, on this, as well as migraine headaches and, and then your antiplatelet regimes, what you should use and your comorbid conditions. So become uh, knowledgeable first before you decide to embark on this and read the literature. And the reason I say that is because I've seen colleagues in the community closing PFOs on lacunar strokes. Um, you need to understand that not ischemic strokes are the same, and we're no experts in identifying these, <coughs> becoming uh, involved, in, and certainly um, working closely with your neurology colleagues is uh, first uh, and foremost extremely vital and important in the decision making. Use your clinical tools. Uh, the rope score, someone asked uh, the question in the audience. Yes, these are clinical tools that we use, just like we use Chad's VAS scores for AFib. 
and these allow you to, uh, in some ways, navigate through patient selection and utilizing these scores may be valuable to your practice. So not all PFOs are the same. Dr. Inglesi's talked about anatomy. I've had patients refer to me because they have a few bubbles crossing the septum, and yes, there's two or three bubbles that you may be able to notice, but these are probably just tiny coincidental uh, defects that are simply coincidental. Understand the pathology. Uh, this isn't rare, and if you decide to embark in this, you'll be surprised, but cardiologists calling you and saying, Dr. Kubedu, I'd like to send you a patient with a PFO who has right atrial and right ventricular enlargement or maybe pulmonary hypertension. We know that PFOs don't do that, so maybe there's something else in the mix. Um, and you hear it time after time. And again, the purpose of this is, um, you know, visioning what you're going to perceive and what you're going to face as you develop your own program and your own experience. Going back to uh, PFO size and understanding uh, anatomy and causation. Um, you know, our clinical trials uh, all show that certainly there's a higher likelihood of a PFO-mediated stroke from those that are moderate to large and those with atrial septal aneurysms. So do, write what, do what's right for patients P is, and try to figure out whether this is a PFO-mediated event or simply an incidental finding. So select patients that will benefit most, use your ROPE score, avoid unnecessary procedures, follow a comprehensive evaluation. Certainly a shared decision making is encouraged and uh, the concept of developing a heart-brain team is uh, something that you should consider, not only for PFOs, but maybe for the left atrial, patient, uh, uh, left atrial appendage closure uh, program as well. Um, if you're taking more than five minutes to cross a PFO, step back and think, does this really need to be closed? Um, so a lot of things go into play and not only clinical, but anatomical. Certainly recommend pre-procedural TEE. I think this is something that is very important and everyone should uh, consider because it allows you to confirm the diagnosis, allows you to characterize the defect and risk stratify from an anatomical standpoint whether this is a PFO-mediated stroke or not. Uh, procedural planning, it allows you to really you know, go in there with an understanding of what you're facing. Um, and rule out other potential comorbid conditions. One thing I want to add is a negative bubble study during a TE does not necessarily rule out a PFO, and um, that's something important to keep in mind. And this is a case example of that. This is a 58-year-old patient that was referred to me after a cryptogenic embolic stroke. The referring doctor mentioned that he had a positive bubble study on a transthoracic. Unfortunately, I didn't have those images when he came to see me. But he did have an abnormal MRI and a negative workup, including an event monitor. So I did a TE to further characterize the defect, and immediately I concluded that he was wrong. Um, so I called him up after the TE. I didn't see a PFO, and he said, uh, Robert, uh, trust me, he did have a very meaningful PFO, or at least bubble study. So as soon as the patient woke up, I asked my uh, echo tech to do an echo bubble study on the same patient. And you will notice that um, after his TE was completely unrevealing, on the right panel with Valsalva, the patient had a very, very impressive um, shunt. So keep these differentials in mind. And although TE is very useful, don't eliminate um, your Valsalva with transthoracic echo alone. So for PFO implanters and those who decide to embark, you need to become familiar with the etiologies of ischemic stroke, clinical syndromes associated, the stroke phenotypes, understanding uh, your scores uh, that are available, the data from randomized clinical trials, cardiac imaging techniques, indications and contraindications to PFO closure, and the understanding of a multidisciplinary team approach. From an operator experience and requirements, some of this is taken directly from this consensus statement. Uh, you need to have expertise in catheter, wires, and sheath manipulations. Usually, the operators doing these techniques are either trained in structural heart, pediatric interventionalists, or those adult interventionalists that really decide to in, uh, engage in doing these. Meticulous techniques to avoid arrhythmias, thrombus, and air embolism, along with techniques for, for management of vascular axis. So in general, they encourage operators to have some baseline uh, experience with structural heart procedures as listed in the document. 
Also keep in mind, physicians should also be aware of the potential of late complications, um, erosions, embolization, nickel allergy, and arrhythmias, although I will say that for the GORE reduced trial, uh, we have never seen erosions with this device uh, long term. Uh, in terms of uh, the procedural specialist qualifications, I won't spend much time on this, uh, but if you look at bullet point number four, uh, the consensus experts recommend uh, more than 50 lifetime structural or congenital heart catheter interventions with either a minimum of 25 involving septal interventions or 12 specific to PFO device placement. For new operators, a mandatory peer-to-peer -peer training course Physician, proctor, or mentor during interventional training for a total of 10 cases. Physician, proctor uh, present for three to five cases for each uh, new device system. And if you're already in, uh, doing PFOs and uh, you want to have a sustainable program, over a two-year period they recommend uh, over 30 procedures that involve septal interventions or 15 specific to PFO device placement. So you can use these as a benchmark or as a reference for hospital credentialing and for your uh, your hospital and your group. In terms of medical facility, what the hospital requirements are, more than 100 structural and congenital heart interventions in the last two years leading to PFO program initiation, and yearly and thereafter 50 structural congenital interventions, at least 25 of which involve septal interventions and or 12 specific to PFO device placement. So these are really, these are guidelines. These are consensus document. This is what I think uh, some of the hospitals will start to use as a benchmark for hospital credentialing and beginning these programs. Um, operators performing PFO closures should master imaging modality. We've touched on this, but becoming familiar with your fluoroscopy, with your TEE, and intracardiac echo. Uh, initially, if you're just starting these, you want to uh, probably start with TEE and general anesthesia. However, try to migrate close, uh, quickly into ICE, as we've heard earlier. There's definitely a lot of advantages with intracardiac echo imaging. It's safe, patient preference, local anesthesia. You get wonderful and clear visual, visualization of the intraatrial septum and the anatomy. It gives you operator independence and probably less hospital resource and coordination of care with your anesthesia team. These are some of the uh, ICE catheters that are available in the market. Becoming familiar with the anatomical variants of PFO anatomy is vital for your success, and I won't spend much time with this, but this is part of the knowledge base that, needs, that you need to develop. There are high-risk features that certainly make uh, PFO-mediated strokes uh, much more likely. Management of complications is important and part of the operator experience that needs to be built and created if you decide to embark in this program. Becoming familiar with all your tools, certainly it's good to learn that there's two uh, PFO occluders in the market and becoming familiar with the utilization of both of these is important for a tailored approach in the management of PFO closure. Recognize your limitations. Understand that you will have circumstances that you may not be able to address and maybe early in your experience you may want to have more proctored support. Don't be afraid to refer out to centers that have higher volume and avoid complications early on because that will definitely start you in the wrong way, wrong direction. Um, this is a slide that I brought to some of the marketing efforts that we've done. If you're deciding to start in a PFO program, you need institutional support, your marketing team. Um, we have a multidisciplinary team um, and in this slide you'll see representation from the neurology group um, as well as hematology, oncology, um, and um, pulmonary medicine. Outreach educational programs are vital for your success. I encourage you to you do these um, in educating your community. Invite your neurologist, cardiologist, hematologist, neuroophthalmologist, ED staff, hospitalists. They're the ones that have access to many of these patients and are at the front line of patients that come in with strokes initially. Um, but this has been a very uh, useful means of really educating the community and identifying potential patients that may benefit from this therapy. Finally, as you develop a program and become uh, 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 an expert in the field, you will also have the opportunity to participate in clinical trials that will lead to further uh, market differentiation for your region and further referrals. So to conclude, uh, read the consensus document, understand the need and demands of your hospital system, decide if you're really ready to focus and devote time and effort in this uh, new therapy, become familiar with the data evidence-based practice, the tools, intracardiac echo, 
Um, spend time uh, identifying who your team will be. Developing a partner and the neuro neurology partner is vital for the success of this program. Start with your easiest case, avoid early complications, and certainly engage the marketing team in outreach awareness programs. So good luck. Thank you.